Hey, what's up guys? Today we're gonna tenderize a steak using an onion. And the reason we're gonna be able to use this onion is because it contains proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic enzymes break down proteins. Most famously, we know a pineapple containing bromelain, its effective enzyme helps tenderize meats. We know papaya contains papain, that helps to break down meat. People actually take these enzymes as supplements. They're actually used widely within the food industry, bromelain and papain to tenderize meats uh, as a powder form. And it works so well that if you leave it on the meat too long, it'll actually turn to mush. These are very powerful enzymes. Another one that we know is koji. The fungus Aspergillus has a knack for breaking down proteins as well. So it's all throughout the animal kingdom. One of the underutilized enzyme vehicles is the onion. So most famously in the 1930s, someone came to a restaurant and requested that their steak be tender and the chef who knew all about this process grated an onion or chopped it up very finely and coated the steak within it as well as to cut some slits in it to, to actually physically tenderize it. Uh, and it turned out to be a big hit. And so we're gonna take some points from that dish and just kind of make it our own. We're gonna showcase the power of the onion to be able to tenderize meats. So the first thing we're gonna do is get these onions cut up as finely as possible. Sometimes I like to get rid of the first layer. So I'm just gonna go with the super rough chop here because I'm gonna get these blended up. Basically, you just want the juice from the onion, chopping it, as well as using some salt to extract that juice. What I'm gonna do now is weigh out my onions and then I'm gonna add a percentage of salt. I don't wanna go too crazy. And if I weigh the onions out by the gram, I know that I can just do 1% of salt or 2% of salt, almost like making a sausage. So if you take the time to be precise during the mundane parts of the dish, you'll ultimately come out with a better end product. So we're gonna go in. So I'm gonna add 1% of that in salt. It's gonna be three grams of salt. I'm just gonna add that in. And now we're gonna blend this up. Again, creating as much cell wall rupture as possible will help extract the juices, which are what we need to actually help get this steak tenderized. We're gonna blend this up into a pulp. There are a couple of ground rules for this particular enzyme. It works best at room temperature. So if you are going to marinate it in the onion pulp, then you need to do so over the course of 30 minutes to about one hour if you're gonna do it at room temp. Now, if you're gonna do this over a longer period, say overnight, you must put it in the fridge. The enzymatic activity is still active in the fridge. However, it is at a reduced rate due to the temperatures. Remember, this particular enzyme is most active at room temperature. And of course, the inverse of that is upping the temperature will increase to a certain extent the activity. We begin to see optimal enzymatic breakdown at around 50 to 55 degrees Celsius. So if you're thinking like me, you're thinking sous vide at 131, and then if you were to go up to around 140, from 131 Fahrenheit to 140, we begin to see the activity sort of taper off. It tapers off not automatically and in one big like off switch, but it begins to taper off pretty significantly over a longer period of time. Optimally, we would say 30 minutes to an hour at room temperature on whatever piece of meat you're doing it. And then we'd wanna go sous vide anywhere from 128 to 130 for probably an hour or until it's fully cooked. So there's a lot of possibilities, but you just kind of have to remember sort of the ground rules. Overnight in the fridge, if you're gonna cook it the next day. Um, if you're gonna cook it today, then you need to just do 30 minutes to one hour at room temp. And then if you're gonna do it sous vide, I would say the highest temp you wanna put your meat at is gonna be 131. The range of safety would be 128 to 131. Botulism can happen at temperatures under 130. So you just wanna be mindful of that in particular when using a aromatic in its raw form. The steak I have here is a flap steak. And it is taken from the bottom sirloin of the cow, which is underneath the top sirloin. The top sirloin is underneath the tenderloin and the tenderloin is underneath the sirloin at the very tippy top of the cow's back. So this is somewhat fibrous, but it has a good amount of marbling and it's gonna do very well over high heat. We're not going to test how tender we can make a steak by buying a steak like a ribeye or a tenderloin. That would be pointless. So what we're gonna do is a steak that is a little bit tougher, but has good flavor, uh, not only to save money, 
uh, but again, to just test the hypothesis. So first, I'm going to physically tenderize the meat by doing some cuts, not super deep, but deep enough so that the outer portion of the meat can get touched by the marinade. So it's important to remember that when marinating, uh, you can only get about one fourth of an inch deep on the meat. You'll never go deeper than that on a marinade. Now, this is contrasted with brining, whereby through the process of osmosis, you allow salt water to switch the place of the water within the protein itself. Uh, marination can only go so far due to the fact that the molecules are much larger, including sugar, uh, than salt, uh, and it's not really small enough to just kind of make it deeper within the meat. So yeah, here I'm just uh, jacarding the meat, if you want to call it that. Uh, just doing some, some minor cuts, maybe about a fourth of an inch deep, nothing crazy. Uh, whenever you are doing something like this, you want to make sure that the cuts on the underside of the meat are going to be running opposite to uh, the way that you cut on the front side here, so that the meat itself doesn't completely lose all of its structure. So I see that my cuts are running this way. I would not want to run them this way on the meat again. So I'm going to go from a different direction. All right, so we're just going to repeat the same process. And then we're also going to do some injecting because it is a thicker piece of meat. Remember, marinating can only get you about a fourth of an inch deep into the meat. And you do need to take some additional measures to make sure that you really get down into the meat. This meat is nearly room temp, so it's ready for the enzymes to work their magic. Because I'm doing it sous vide, I probably won't let it go at room temp for so long. Um, so there is our meat and I'm going to inject it with some of the marinade. So I have my handy dandy uh, marinator here and I'm going to just make sure that I get into some of the thicker parts with the onion. So I'm just going to go in, inject, kind of move around a little bit. That way we get like a full coverage of the onion enzyme within the meat mainly wanting to go for the thicker parts. I think I'm stopped up. There it is. Now I am going to have a little bit of onion <laughs> remnant within the meat itself. So um, ideally you might just only have the, uh, the liquid of the onion. So remember you do have a little bit of salt within this marinade. So you want to kind of temper your, your seasoning uh, hand. Salt. Not a crazy amount. Remember, season up from on high. All right. So since I'm doing it sous vide, I probably won't let it rest. Uh, or else the meat turned to mush. But remember, we did a good injection and we're going to chamber back this. Obviously, it's gonna taste really good, so that's all I have a plus. We're gonna get this chamber back and then into the sous vide. All right, so one of the ways I like to take the guesswork out of cooking sous vide is to use an internal probe thermometer. As you can see here, I have a piece of foam tape that has been applied to the vacuum bag and it's going to maintain the seal as the internal probe goes into the thickest part of the meat. So that's what we're going to do here now. We're going to go ahead and set this to, I like to go 130, 131. All right, so we're going to go sous vide. I'm going to do it until it finishes and that's going to vary by the size and the starting temperature of the meat itself. Just baby down with some magnets we have full submersion and we are ready to go right now the meat is at 70 degrees so it's perfect room temp that is the temperature in which the enzymatic process is most active and again it's going to go up to 130 completely so we're going to be right in that 
that beautiful range for the enzymes to kind of work their magic. And we're gonna let the sous vide do its thing and then come back. All right, so we have an internal temperature of 128 right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull it. It looks like we cooked it for about one hour and 20 minutes. I'm gonna get it out on a towel. All right, so the next step, anytime you're cooking sous vide, is you always wanna make sure the meat is dry. Um, otherwise, you will not get a good sear. Wow. So, looks like uh, pretty tender. It looks like a pretty good full coverage. This thing is gonna be pretty nice. It smells pretty good. Seasoning is pretty good. Um, just want to make sure it's padded dry completely. So we're going to take this out back and give it a whipping, AKA sear it, avocado oil. So a major key here when you're dealing with any fibrous cut is cutting against the grain. So the meat flows that way. I want to cut into that grain so that it's a more tender uh, mouthfeel. Let go right there. First one to say it's raw wins. That's a perfect medium rare. Shout out to the sous vide. It is going to be pretty tender. Man, this is well seasoned. That's a good looking crust, man. Like solid. It's gonna be a little hard. Hell, this spot could just fall apart from nothing. And that's partially due to the sous vide, it's partially due to the enzymes. So I think we kind of found the perfect sort of balance. The plating style is gonna be like a Dunbury, uh, which is just a dome of rice. I've got some fried rice that I did earlier on the walk and I'm just gonna build my dome. This has like orange zest, it's got some Thai basil, a little bit of egg, and then some scallion, nothing crazy going on in it. I've got my big bowl here and we're going to nestle the dome of rice within it. Wow, that was probably a little bit too loud. I think our dome is good. Nice little dome. We got our rice dome. Now I'm going to hit it with the steak and I'm going to layer it around ever so beautifully. Our beef is perfectly centered. Next I'm gonna hit it with just a little bit of scallion. I'm gonna have a good contrast of color on the presentation. And then we're gonna go in with a mound of caramelized onions. But we want to be sure to make a bed for our lovely yolk. So we'll kind of just carve out a little dugget for our lightly pickled egg yolk. I just drain it. And these went in this soy sauce pickling liquid for just a little bit, maybe an hour, room temp, nothing crazy. After a million gajillion hours, we finally have steak done buried. Perfect consistency there. Dig in, yolk, some of that beef. So much for mommy. That steak is tender. Man, well seasoned. I think the injection was really the right way to go. A little bit of the acidity and richness from the yolk combining with the wok heat. Oh man. Really good key component here is that the rice has a little bit of orange zest, so the beef and the orange pairs magnificently. Stay tuned for more.